Okay, our next speaker is Joseph Mohov of Lockheed Martin. Hi, can everybody hear, hear me all right? So, oh uh, yeah, here we go. All right, so as he mentioned, I'm uh, Joey Moholtz. I'm with uh, actually All Points Logistics. So I work actually out of the Lockheed facility on Orion. So uh, it's a good company with an unfortunately common acronym. So it provided a bit of confusion, so. All right, so this is our integrated <coughs> test facility. Um, we actually just got this last summer. Uh, it's a pretty impressive test rig that we get to work with. Um, it's a great sell for our interns. Um, so it's not often you get to work with something that you get to like touch. And, and uh, so you can actually see there's a guy here that um, to give you some scale and uh, we, we learned about the, the missions yesterday. Um, so if you think being a couple weeks in something this size could get a little claustrophobic, but um, interesting nonetheless. So, all right, so what does it take to get Orion from here and around the moon and back or to Mars? Um, I'll go over some of the uh, avionics as well as some of our uh, fault detection and recovery. So, so our big architecture is uh, what's called integrated modular avionics. So this is something that originated in the aircraft industry. Uh, and we adopted because of the millions of hours of use it's had. So that obviously made sense for us to not just write something from the ground up and uh, do it ourselves. Uh, software engineers, we love doing that, but uh, you can't argue with a million hours, so. All right, so it was developed in 1996, um, and our implementation uh, we get from Honeywell. So Honeywell writes a lot of like the, the core software. They hey, provide us with a lot of the hardware, and we write our applications on top of that. So we have all of these, uh, let's see, we have robust modular, easily scale design, uh, decentralized. So these are all very good terms that we like to use. Um, it's, it's good for managers and uh, something we all seem to strive for. So the big part is uh, this virtual backplane. So um, the virtual backplane is kind of what we what allows us to decentralize the design, make it scale, scalable. Um, the, let's see. So let's just, uh, let's get into it. So we have this large picture. So a, as an application developer, I can just assume I'm unit A here and uh, I can write my code and um, I don't care what unit B or unit C is doing just as long as I get my inputs. So I've got my inputs and then I do my processing and I hand them off to somebody else. So uh, this is kind of what it allows us to do. So we don't have to know about the underlying architecture all that much. Um, we just focus on my inputs, process them, outputs, publish them on the virtual backplane. And uh, anybody else can pick them up and do as they wish. So. The other part that gives us, uh, that, that allows us, uh, that sold us on this design um, is say units A, D, and Y are, are critical components. So these can't fail, uh, but if unit B fails, that's great. Okay, so unit B goes away, it doesn't take down everybody. So this is kind of nice, so unit B can fail, it can come back, and uh, it works out well for us. So. Um, so we, we explain to all of our, uh, some of our new hires, we go, they're kind of like virtual machines. And then Honeywell goes, don't describe them as virtual machines. Well, Honeywell's not here, so they're virtual machines. <laughs> um, so we can just kind of bring them up and uh, everything works well. So that's the conceptual architecture. So going from conceptual to actually how it works 
is actually, there, there's a lot involved. So to, we can actually put, so as uh, you guys heard Rob yesterday talking, and uh, you'll, you'll all be experts on Orion by the end of this. Um, so you can put unit A here, and unit B here, another unit A here, and then maybe a D here, whatever you want. You can kind of mix and match them. It does take effort to mix and match them, but you can. So that, uh, as Rob was saying yesterday, we have a display control module, and we have a flight control module. Um, but worst comes to worst, we can kind of uh, move components around, and now our display module is now our flight module if worse comes to worse. So, um, and it's all connected to this high-speed data bus. So we heard yesterday about uh, Space Fiber, I, I believe it was. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, so we have Space Fiber. We don't use that. We use, uh, we use time-triggered Ethernet. I'll get into that a little bit later. But it, it can be whatever. So, um, so we chose this so the, the industry, we all like to say, we take our SDCs and we make them very specific for this. They are a flight computer. They cannot be anything else. Um, so the shuttle did this. Um, they used to do this back on a lot of the old airplanes. Um, so they would have like 80 computers that are very specific that can only be these computers. So we decided like, well, all right, this, that, that is great, but if you want to add another FCM, so you want to have five FCMs, you can do that, and now you have more redundancy. So that all works very well. All right, so we use the A-Rink standards. So some of you are familiar with the A-Rink standards. So 651 is kind of what defines the whole thing. Um, so it gives IMA is just kind of a broad architecture for system, software, hardware, data, all of it. Um, I'll try to focus on so the software portions today. Um, so we have this idea of partitions. So time and space partitions. Um, what does that mean? So memory. So we have partitions, and it is GNC lives in a partition, CMDH lives in a partition, so on and so forth. Well, GNC is, it allows GNC to operate and keep their head down and just focus on their inputs and outputs. So in order to do that, uh, we keep everybody in a time and space partition, which means you have your own memory and you have your own CPU allocation time. So. Uh, maybe a couple seconds or I mean a couple milliseconds, whatever it is. So there's no way that anybody can come in and corrupt your memory. Uh, and no, by, no way an overrun on partition B can affect you. So you're just, it, it, it's a bit easier that way. So we do this, we do the memory resource allocation. We do the memory resourcing uh, with a memory management unit. So it says only GNC can modify memory that GNC wrote. You can read GNC memory, but you can't write to it. So that's very good. So, uh, and time partitioning is what I said it is. Saying, all right, you get your two milliseconds, and uh, nobody can mess with that two milliseconds. Um, I believe there was a gentleman from JPL that spoke yesterday that said, let's, let's try to make this all very, um, not have 80 interrupts. Uh, we actually have, uh, let's see, we have one. So we can get Matt Damon to Mars with just one interrupt. Um, it's one external interrupt. So <laughs> can we get him back? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Do we want him back? Um, so we can, we, we, ex we operate off of just a frame interrupt. Um, but we do have multiple threads. So we have our high rate thread, and then we have our less high rate thread, and then we have our slow threads. So our high rate thread will execute, and when it's done, then maybe our slow, our 
our less high rate threads will execute. And if there's an execution time, then uh, that will execute. If we're done with our, our, our two milliseconds, then that one is cut off. And maybe the next time around, we can get to it. So it's very surreal. Uh, the higher rate the thread is, the higher the priority. So um, just as, so it makes it easy, so as long as you just maintain a close eye on your static variables um, and your globals, you, it, it minimizes the risk. So it doesn't, elite, it doesn't mean you can't hang yourself, but uh, it helps. Um, so it's all handled by, we use Green Hills Integrity OS. So we're a layered approach, so we all love our layers. Um, so we have our OS, our Integrity OS, and then we have Apex on top of that. And then my group is another layer on top of that. So we abstract out the Honeywell core layer. Um, and then the application partitions execute on top of that. So Rob told you guys all GNC is the most important. Well, I have the microphone, and uh, my group is the most important. Um, so let's see. There, there's one, so I, I lied to you that we all use this. Backup flight software does not. So they operate on their own paradigm, and this is to avoid common mode failures. So they use CFS, CFE. They are not A-Rink compatible. Um, they use some of our A-Rink stuff, so sampling ports, they'll use those. So a sampling port just means I have my outputs, and it gives me some place to put my outputs. So that's kind of all that is. Um, but th yeah, so this is by design. So they use VxWorks. We use Integrity. Uh, we even use different processors. Um, so let's see. All right, so here's a picture of this. So uh, as I said, so we have GNC, CNDH. They're all connected to share IO resources. So whether it's on the same control module or, uh, or they could be on different modules, just as long as they can all see this shared IO resources. So you have this wall between them all. So you're fairly safe that way. Um, I say fairly safe, so GNC is a very important partition. So yes, we do need them. And if they mess up, then bad things happen. So if they do go down, then you probably want to reset the entire board. Because um, you can't necessarily trust their outputs then. So just reset and start back from square one. So. All right, so as I said, this is used on the F-22. It's used on 787. It's used on the A-380. Um, the 787 is actually, they're a very similar architecture to ours. Uh, they, so if, it's nice. I don't know if anybody has flown one. I, I haven't yet. Um, so if they're flying their 787s and they're noticing a bug or something like that's happened, it's nice because since we share the same architecture and they have a mill over all these hours of use, uh, it can be rolled into these, these fixes can be rolled into our architecture by Honeywell. And uh, it makes us that much more robust. So it, uh, it's a nice perk. So as I said, we use the time-triggered Ethernet. I think the TT Tech folks have a, a talk today, so I'll keep it brief, and uh, I won't steal their thunder. Um, so we call it the onboard data network. Sometimes it's the Orion data network. But anyway, so ODN, so I'll remember this. Um, we, we, we have our fair share of acronyms as well. All right, so for the purpose of this presentation, I'll just kind of boil time-triggered Ethernet down into this one slide. Uh, it, time-triggered Ethernet allows us to have a high-speed deterministic system 
that we can use COTS component for. So uh, it, it provides three tiers. Um, this tier one is what a lot of our traffic operates on. So it's a guaranteed delivery at a guaranteed time. So if I am GNC and I publish at time X, I can guarantee that C and DH will get it at time Y. Um, so we're triply redundant. So you can definitely guarantee that it's going to get there. Um, So the folks yesterday, the space fiber folks showed you guys, I don't know if, if everybody was here for it. So they, they had this, this large, I mean this Excel spreadsheet almost that said, all right, if we, they, they kind of outlined this, that if you want this message from this thread at time X, you can guarantee it's gonna get here by time Y. And it seemed pretty nice. Um, the problem is, is if you have thousands of messages and you have to, very carefully pick, figure out if this one goes at this time and it needs to get here by this time and this is also publishing and it, it, it really messes <coughs> things up. So a lot of our time is spent making sure that we have this deterministic network because it is a gigabit a second. Uh, it's very fast which means there's a lot of data which means we have to really make sure that everything is, is scheduled correctly. So we don't want to stop, stomp on any toes or we don't want to flood the network or whatever it is. So a lot of time goes into that, that first tier. So the second tier, rate constraints. So these are messages that we have to get there, but whenever. So these are some of like our boot messages. We'll get there. We want to make sure that we get our boot messages, but um, if they're a second late, that's fine. We just want to make sure. And this is just, uh, basically like any ethernet um, best effort. So we can, this is like video stuff. So if we miss a frame of video, that's fine. Okay, so I, I told you guys a little bit about the background of the architecture. So here is the architecture. Uh, it looks fantastic. Um, <laughs> so, we have this concept of VMCs. Uh, what we care about in a VMC is this, so these FCMs. Um, so we have FCMs, which are the flight control modules. This is the stuff I work on a lot. So what keeps us floating and going towards our destination. Um, and then we have the ODN, which is these lines, all these multicolored lines. So that's our triply redundant. You can kind of see the various colors of designs. <laughs> And then we have the PDUs. So there was some conversation yesterday and even a bit today of how do we make sure we train embedded developers and they're very rare. The nice part about our architecture is you just have to, a lot of the IO, all of our IO, I'm gonna say, is done by the PDUs. So these are, um, so like our analog to digital converters, that sort of thing. So things that fire thrusters is gonna be out of the PDUs. So if I'm GNC or whatever, I don't have to write to the register and execute it. I just say, write my message. Um, so I don't have to have a ton of knowledge about embedded systems, so we have a lot of interns, so we do a, there's a lot of interns that come up, and so we getting interns up to speed, I don't know, 20 of them or something, as long as they're decent at C++, they can easily write applications on an FCM, and we just say, here's how you communicate, and go. Write base code. Um, so the way PDUs have been explained is the FCMs are the brain, the ODN is kind of like our nervous system, and the PDUs are kind of like our muscles, so uh, we do an action from those. All right, so Rob showed this yesterday. He got, he, <laughs> Rob got all the fun videos and the, uh, the, the cool PR slides. Uh, I'll show you guys this. So this is, uh, there's no jealousy there. Um, so this is the crew module. 
Uh, so this is where the crew's gonna live and do their thing. Uh, this is the service module, so this portion is ESA, and then we have the, uh, the CMA, which is the connector between the two. Um, so you can kind of see there's some PDUs that we control uh, for the, the SM. All right, and then uh, I just got ahead of myself, so outlining that here's the VMCs, here's the PDUs, the parts that we really care about. So I put this one up, it's, so what do we do if we have a failure? Um, this is a very hot topic and it's something that we're still talking about. I put up this slide because um, it's the Apollo 13 and this mission drives a lot of what we do. So you'll, we hear the, the term corner case and that can never happen. Well, <laughs> they, they didn't expect this. So <coughs> you have to plan for everything. And it, the questions that come up to say, well, what if this happens? What if we are on the other side of Mars or, and a failure happens or whatever? So because this happens, I spend a lot of time on my job brainstorming and making sure our code is robust. So my wife says, call Tom Hanks. That's not the answer. <laughs> uh, so here we go. So let's get into some, what, just examples of what can cause our failures. So. One of the failures, so if we have our, our FCMs here, so four FCMs that are BFS. Um, I put up there bugs in flight, bugs in flight software. So because I'm a developer and we do, we have our occasional bug, um, a null pointer say. So if we have a null pointer, all of our FCMs, the requirement we have is that all of our FCMs are identical. So we have bit identical output. So the idea is I am going to create identical output if I'm FCM1. I assume I'm in control. And I can guarantee that FCM2 is doing the same thing. Well, that's nice. But if I have a null pointer exception to 1, that means I'm going to have a null pointer exception 2, 3, 4 if we're all executing at the same time. So. that the failures this can cause, we've we looked into quite a bit. Well, the interesting thing is I showed this to our chief software architect, George, and uh, he wrote me back a long email saying, no, don't put bugs in flight software. Uh, I didn't have time to change this. <laughs> and he said, so he came back and he said, I got a lot of slides and I got more presentations and it's for an interesting conversation. Uh, he said, 80%, I, I don't know where he got this number, but it, I'm gonna assume that it's correct. 80% of failures, he, he really likes failures, so I'm gonna trust him. 80% um, of failures are because of requirements. So it's that we did not understand our requirements enough. Um, and I, the more I get into it, this more I agree with him. That we've, the, we've had a lot of conversations here today to say, how do we make better code? Well, we're pretty darn good at making good code. We're not great at figuring out our requirements ahead of time. So, and if you look, a lot of the failures, so there's, there's two failures that come to mind with this. One is, so I was reading the other day, there's an Apollo failure. So somebody, there was, a, a, so there was an engineer testing a long time ago back when they were doing Apollo. They f had a failure um, well, an engineer was running a simulation and they found out if I run procedure A while I'm in flight, that it will reset the box. And so this engineer was a very good engineer and they went to NASA and they said, okay, this is what happens if you run procedure A in flight. NASA said, well, we should never run a, a procedure A in flight because astronauts don't make mistakes. S well, they ran procedure A in flight. Uh, so Apollo 8, I think it was, uh, 
They ran procedure A in flight, and they wiped out all of their navigation data. So they're in this floaty mode uh, going to the moon, and they have no navigation data. So they had to scramble to figure out how do we come back from this. So bug in flight software, no. They tried. Uh, but it was requirements and all this. Um, the other one, uh, I've got lots of stories for this, so I'll try to keep my stories to a minimum. The other one is I put bugs in flight software, so we're flight software, and I focus on that, but the thing that we don't consider is hardware failures, hardware common cause failures. So all of these FCMs are generally they, they have the same architecture. So if you have a, if you have a hardware failure, it is going to have, happen on all of them. So shuttle, so STS-9 had a failure in their hardware. So the problem they had is, so the shuttle would take off and then it would do its mission and then they would land. And then they would kind of refurbish it and then they would take off and they would do their mission and then it would land. The problem with that is they were not replacing the avionics hardware every mission. Uh, and so back then, they would do all of their soldering by hand. Um, and if you do this, our, our methods are a lot better now, but uh, this is just for the case of example. So since they were hand solders, as you shake and you go up, you'll see what, what happened on their few hours before reentry. Uh, they had some solder shake loose. And the solder shook loose on two of their four flight computers. So these things happen, uh, and they happen at the same time. So the solder, the solder shook loose. And with the unfortunate part about loose solder is it can cause shorts. So it shorted out the two flight computers. And they had to abort the landing briefly to figure it out and eventually reset. They got one of the flight computers to reset. The uh, other one was just a dud. Um, so this is why he, this is one of the presentations he sent me, um, to say, listen, we are darn good at writing flight software. There are other issues around our sphere of influence that, that prevent us from executing a successful mission. All right, so radiation hits, so we are a, uh, self-checking pair. So we, we operate differently than the shuttle. So the shuttle was four flight computers and uh, they all had a voting architecture. So this is where I think we should be. Uh, and they all vote and they say, all right, let's fire thruster X. And then they all say, okay. They all agree. So thruster X is fired. Um, we are not. So I told you we're on this time triggered ethernet. Uh, So if one, the nice part about this is since we're a self-checking pair, so we have two, two SPCs effectively connected, and if their data lines or something don't match up, then we reset. So, uh, so if we get a radiation hit and our data lines don't match, just a reset. So the shuttle didn't have this, so if there was a radiation hit on one of the flight computers, then that flight computer resets, and then you still have the other three. So um, the, that helps a lot in a lot of our fail situations. So we don't have to say, well, what if you hit get a radiation upset and you start executing bad commands from GNC? Well, you'll just reset. So that's very nice. Um, dead bus. So this is a complete power failure. This one is difficult. Um, I don't know how much I can get into this one. So this is your, say we're in floaty mode and you have a complete failure. BFS typically would take, you want BFS to take over, but it's also down. So this one we're still talking about. Uh, flight and ground crew, crew. So this is something you guys don't have to deal with uh, in a lot of cases. Uh, the flight crew, so we, we, we do love to assume we're an autonomous vehicle, but we're not. 
So they can reset, they just say, we don't like STM4, they can reset us. Or if we're deviating for some reason and we're not the same, they can reset us or whatever. So we just have to deal with that. All right, so how do we recover? We do what all of you guys do. We get our meetings together. So we're still having our meetings. This is, uh, I think, Apollo 17, their meeting. We look very dapper as well when we meet. Um, so we do our meetings, and we come up with all of these questions. So some of these questions we are still dealing with. Um, it is not an easy problem to solve. Uh, so there's a few that, what if the crew is unconscious? And you want to, when do we auto-enable our outputs? So how do we say that an FCM is good? Uh, well, eventually you just have to say, yep, yeah, I'm good. Um, this is a very, very small subset of our questions. So uh, where should we switch? So I, I won't get into those. I'm running a little late. So. so what we came up with, this is one of our, uh, our flow charts. So Rob spoke yesterday about our survival capabilities where you can kind of guide the spacecraft yourself. So if we have a failure, uh, make sure that this is still active so we can still do this if we need to. If everybody's down, uh, we can still get home safely guiding themselves. Uh, we do have safe mode, so we'll, we'll, in some cases, we'll go into safe mode. Safe mode is a FCM state that uh, it tries to kind of recover and say, like, all right, point us at the sun or whatever, or point, make sure we are pointed at the sun so we have enough power. Um, Safe mode is tough because so the, the STS folks were talking yesterday, or SLS, sorry. Um, and if we launch off, it's, what, a couple minutes. We don't, if, if we're in safe mode, we don't want to, we don't want to go, we don't want our commands to be executed while we're in safe mode on top of the rocket because then we'll say, all right, we're on top of the rocket, let's point at the sun that would have devastating outcomes. So we have to be cognizant of that. Um, backup mode, typically what we do, if we have a really bad failure, we always default to our backup mode. So, uh, and we'll still execute in safe mode until the crew says, okay, you guys, uh, the FCMs look good, they have good output, we trust you. So, so let's see. So partitions in initialize independently. So we have all of our partitions come up and then they say, all right, I'm ready to go. And then they'll come up and as soon as they're ready to go and their outputs are valid, then uh, as, as soon as everyone's outputs are valid, then we'll say, okay, now you guys can uh, enter into the working set. So making sure the outputs are valid, trying to go, if, if FCM1 goes down and then wants to come back up and FCM234 are, are coming up, yeah, well, it's like, well, just give them their state data. It's not easy on a time-triggered Ethernet, so you can't just say, here's my state, pfft, dump it all across our, our fast network. You will flood the network, so it's, it's trying to find out which pieces of data do we actually really need to try to get this one back into the working set. It's not, it's still a problem we are solving, but uh, we're getting closer to it. So, let's see. All right, so this is my last slide. So. The interesting part about this is, so we have a lot of shuttle folks um, on our program still, and uh, they, they bring up with them a lot of heritage. So <laughs> the one thing that I've been told a few times is that the shuttle never had to go into backup flight software. So it's not saying that we never will, but it's a very rare case. So that, that's, pretty, that's pretty spectacular in, in their nominal missions. There was a mission, uh, so the Columbia disaster, I think, uh, went into backup flight software. Um, and then we have a probability greater than 101.8 million missions that all of our FCMs will go down. So uh, let's see. All right, that's my presentations. Questions? Are there questions? Uh, wait, 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 Lorraine, catch. 
Oh, yeah. I didn't quite understand the fault tolerance schema for the flight computers. You talked about having self-checking pairs, which is sort of one layer. But on top of that, I, I don't know if it's the partition controller or something, but you know, something is determining who is prime and who has failed, and that mechanism has to be fault tolerant. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So let me go back to let me go back a few slides. So fault tolerance, the, the, the what you really will care about if your fault tolerance is what commands the PDU gets. So what am I actuating? So uh, if you have a self-checking pair, so that is going to take you out of the working set. So that will reset you and your outputs will be invalid. So if you have disabled outputs, the PDU knows who has enabled outputs and who does not. Um, it's one of our message, uh, it's in our message header. Um, all of the FCMs assume they are in charge. The way that we deal with this is we have just, you know, on the PDUs we have a priority, so we just march down our priority. If, if this one has valid outputs, then we will use this one. If this one has valid outputs, then we will use this one. So it may, makes sure that we are always executing on the same inputs to the PDU. So. Yeah, does that answer your question? So it's kind of a distributed fault tolerance flight computer. You have them all sending, potentially sending messages on the yeah, network. So they're going to get four messages. The receiver is making a determination all independently, so that's the distribution. Correct, yeah. And the, the fault tolerance to make sure that that you don't have a bad flight computer still sending is is in your self-checking mechanism somehow, right? Correct, yep. Okay, very good, thank you. <laughs> okay, we, Dr. Adupa. We'll have a small software change while we uh, Get ready. <laughs>